Okay, we should be good. So uh, hi everyone, welcome to the fourth, I believe, uh, Frontiers in Quantum Information and Technology Seminar through the Midwest Quantum Collaboratory. So this is Michigan State's U of M and Purdue. We're very happy today to have uh, Victor Albert from NIST and the University of Maryland, uh, who has done a lot of things in quantum information, uh, uh, one of which, very cool, is the, the zookeeper for the error correction zoo. So a uh, very good resource. And today, Victor is going to tell, uh, have something for everybody about uh, modern quantum tools for bosonic systems. So Victor, thanks so much for joining. And uh, we're very happy to have you give this talk. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to discuss, uh, I guess, uh, several sort of aspects of, of bosonic uh, quantum information processing and, and bosonic communication um, that uh, we've been working on recently. So one of the main motivation of bosonic systems um, is uh, to use their extra space for, say, redundancy for storage or to utilize the space for protocols um, of, of for various quantum applications. And uh, I wanted to sort of organize all the different ways to encode information in bosonic and qubit systems in this plot. So you typically need to have multiple systems, subsystems to, to scale up a technology or a, or a communication protocol. And so those are on the horizontal axis. And uh, the number of states you use per subsystem are on the vertical axis. So if you consider only using qubits, which is the smallest you could use per subsystem, uh, you would have this gray, gray box, which would in include some many qubit systems. And this is something that is uh, uh, typical in, in, in most of the technologies that are you know, aggressively trying to scale up today, uh, namely superconducting circuits, and trapped ions, um, uh, and uh, the, these, these uh, optical tweezer Rydberg uh, arrays. And uh, what, uh, but what, what some other are doing is uh, trying to use this extra space for in, a, in a single subsystem, uh, given some amount of control, it's possible to do so. It's not something that's uh, sort of science fiction. Um, at least some of the levels can be utilized in a controllable way. And uh, the types of systems that uh, are amenable to this type of treatment are um, for the most part, harmonic oscillators. So these are, what is a harmonic oscillator? Well, it's it's just a model, uh, but what it's kind of a euphemism for uh, a continuous variable state space with continuous position and momentum, and uh, uh, it stands for as a as a model for several different technologies. Uh, you know, it models optical fibers, uh, so phononic or photonic modes, basically. Um, there is another set of systems that's also kind of rising up now. Uh, these are various AMO systems. Uh, now that we have good control of atoms and molecules, we can actually utilize the extra states in those systems as well. And uh, one of the first systems is, uh, of course, uh, nuclear nuclear spin states, because those are very uh, typically uh, don't interact very much. And so you can actually use them for storage and, and, and other things. And so. Um, so I'm going to focus on the harmonic oscillator case, uh, but I just wanted to give you this bigger picture. So um, for those maybe not so familiar with continuous variables, uh, there are analogs uh, from the qubit world in the continuous variable world. And basically, uh, if you think of a qubit as a particle on a discrete ring, then an oscillator you can think of as a particle on a line. It's a using notation because an oscillator is a particular Hamiltonian, but Again, it's a it's this euphemism for these these types of state space. Now, um, basis states you can think of just as being position states analogously in the oscillator, um, and there's all sorts of different analogs for things that you may be familiar in the qubit world that uh, exist in the oscillator world. Now, I'm going to discuss kind of three different types of uh, I guess tools or applications. Uh, where um, new kind of continuous variable uh, uh, protocols and tools are used, uh, despite this, the field being very old, you know, since uh, 1920s. So the first uh, application we'll have in mind is, is tomography, so state tomography or tomography of a quantum device. 
Uh, this is necessary because uh, uh, we want to know what the what the device is actually doing, and to do that, it actually takes uh, uh, takes quite a lot of um, quite a lot of fire, firepower because these devices, you know, quantum Hilbert spaces have exponentially scaling number of states. And in continuous variable systems, you have these extra states in, in each subsystem to deal with as well, right? So it's it's uh, devising efficient protocols to do this is something that is uh, is necessary to be able to reliably and, and scalably uh, characterize a quantum device. Um, and before I get to this application, I'm going to actually go overview of, of a mathematical result that uh, um, that we did, and then use that to develop an application. This application in tomography. So um, the the mathematical result that that was done here by 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 um, collaborators and myself is this uh, um, the uh, called a design, so uh, or a quadrature. Um, this is a very sort of general idea that is meant is a, is a tool to and meant to simplify integrals or simplify large complicated sums of of stuff, some particular stuff, uh, in any to to compute them in an easier way. And um, the beautiful part of this to me is that for this, depending on the stuff, the the sum and the integral are easy are, are equal. And uh, I'll demonstrate this with this example. So let's say the thing you're integrating over is the Sorin's triangle, and you have these uh, um, black points. Uh, these three black points will form the 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 thing you're uh, you're going to be summing over, and the stuff you're going to be uh, wanting to to sum over the over the triangle is some polynomial. Uh, in the two variables, because the triangle is defined in 2D. So if you have some degree two polynomial and you want to integrate uh, its value, you know, it, it, the function over this triangular region, then it turns out that uh, that integral is actually equal to just evaluating the polynomial at the three points I, in, the, in the three black points and dividing by six. So it, it very much simplifies this. Now, uh, if you have a degree three polynomial, it's not going to work. So th this is, this equality only holds for certain stuff, as I said. So the uh, designs are ubiquitous in 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 basically the classical world as well. So the primary application for them, as far as I know, is numerical integration, and um, these are called quadratures or cubatures in that world. Your quantum chemists might be familiar with this, and um, Something that uh, so you can put points and and sum over points on various different types of spaces. So numerical integration, they do it on the real you know space. But uh, say you want to you know integrate over some sphere in high dimension or in any dimension, then then you would deal with spherical designs to help simplify those integrals. And uh, now the quantum applications have really picked up with designs uh, in over the unitary group, which you can think of as some space, and. Uh, they're useful for uh, for benchmarking and doing tomography on quantum devices. And the, the designs we're going to be trying to generalize here to continuous variable systems are state designs. So these are designs over the space of quantum states, which is this fancy CPD minus one symbol. So, well, so we're dealing with quantum states. And how do I map this sort of quantum world to this idea of integrating some polynomials over a space, right? And uh, there's a very simple that I think kind of like underappreciated uh, 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 way to kind of explain this. Um, and this is um, this is what I'm going to do now. So let's consider quantum state designs for degree two polynomials. And uh, the thing we're going to average is a degree two polynomial. But what is it a polynomial of? Well, it's a polynomial in each of the state amplitudes of any state. So any state psi has a bunch of amplitudes, psi j. And um, we want to integrate a degree two polynomial in all of those variables. And there's a lot of variables. There's d variables here, where d is the dimension of the space. Well, so, so if we start with this uh, um, average over the space of quantum states, which I can express as this statistical looking you know, expectation value, uh, First, I ex express my polynomial explicitly, and well, it's a polynomial in the variables, and it's degree uh, uh, two in the amplitude, sorry, and degree two in their complex conjugates. And I can write it like this. And so 
there's four indices because there's two for the for the for the amplitudes and two for the complex conjugates. And then it turns out that I can now use go into this operator world that we're all more familiar with and just write this as the expectation value of a particular operator corresponding to the polynomial with two copies of the state. And just this is just rearranging indices. And now, uh, if you plug in um, the the design formula that if you if you have a design that can that can do this expectation value and the, using the definition of design, this is actually equal to the average overall pure states of the same uh, expectation value. So this classical you know, notion of integrating some polynomials can be turned into a quantum notion of, of, of integrating an observable, uh, or namely an expectation value with num certain numbers of copies of the state. If you have degree t, you would have t copies of the state. Right, and then you can m apply this mapping back and you get that the, you, you have the resulting integral. So, State designs uh, and unitary designs um, have been determined uh, for uh, many qubit state spaces. And uh, the, the primary sort of player here is this Clifford group, which is the group of sort of easy uh, quantum primitives or operations on, on a, a many qubit space. And um, it's very powerful if for qubits. It's interestingly not so powerful for uh, uh, QDIS, larger dimensional uh, subsystems. And uh, the only work uh, that's trying to, tried to extend this to the continuous variable uh, domain is uh, the, the work by Bloom, Cahoot, and Turner uh, over 10 years ago. And they showed that uh, Gaussian unitaries, which are the analogs of these Clifford types of uh, uh, operations in the continuous variable world, do not form uh, really a design. So they form a trivial design, a one design. So uh, there's not many polynomials that you can integrate, you know, over the um, to, to 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 be useful. And we show that actually it turns out that it's not possible to form unitary designs in any infinite dimensional system. So uh, the power of this Clifford group uh, dies down, but it turns out that you can't, you know, even while while you can have arbitrarily strong, meaning high T designs in discrete variable systems, we you can't do it do any unitary designs in continuous variable systems. So all the tomographic applications would have to be done somewhere somehow in a different way. And designs, unitary designs are very useful in, in tomographic applications. So that's the result. And I just wanted to give you some intuition. Um, so where did the designs go? Well, we'd have to start to show this, we have to start with state designs. And uh, the 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 key thing that basically the my 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 student uh, uh, an Alexi student Joe uh, figured out uh, was that you have to remove normalization. And the reason is is if you don't remove normalization, then certain points that are necessary for uh, for you to make a state design just simply disappear. So, for example, if you have a uniform superposition of of a of states of a d-dimensional qubit, if you take d to infinity. Uh, that state will simply go to the zero vector, right? And um, if you think of quantum states, uh, if you just look at the diagonal pieces of the density matrices, they form what's known as a simplex. So it's this, this, it's this region, you know, it's some probability thing. They're probabilities, so they have to kind of be in this nice compact region called a simplex. And um, the, every point in the simplex, you know, is normalized. And you need a simple, or basically simplices are important ingredients in, in state designs. And if you take, uh, so in, in a state design needs to have some point in the bulk of the simplex. So designs are a uniform sort of creatures. They're uniform distributions of points that kind of capture sort of the space to some degree. And you need some points in the bulk of the space. And uh, one of the points, or you need a point close to the centroid or say at the centroid. The centroid is this point where that corresponds to the probability vector of a, of a uniform superposition of states. And uh, the centroid goes away when you take the d equal to infinity limit. And that's just defining a simplex. And if you don't really have points close to the centroid that you can use that, that survive in the d infinity limit, then you don't have any simplex designs for your infinite dimensional simplex. And since uh, diagonals of density matrices are parameterized by a simplex, as I was saying, no simplex designs means there's no state designs. And more generally, if we start with, if we by contrapositive, by uh, contradiction, we can prove that no state designs means no unitary designs. Because if you had unitary designs, you would have been able to make state designs by applying the unitaries to a particular state. 
and making a set of states that would form a state design. So that's basically the, the, the point. And, and if you remove normalization, then actually kind of the whole, the whole thing blows wide open and you do have some way to define designs. Uh, so Victor, did, quick, 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 quick question, if I could. Of course. On the previous slide, uh, you have the, the limits sort of uh, exploding as, as D goes to infinity. Do, do you have an understanding of, is there an expression like for the right-hand side of this in terms of D, like finite but large? Do you, is there an understanding of this behavior? Of the state going to zero? Yeah, the sort of hardness of, um, of, of forming a design as, as a function of D. Like uh, I, I'm, th I'm thinking about this cartoon in the top right as D goes to infinity. So for any finite D, it's doable. Okay. Only at infinity, it it goes away because for any finite D, you get a vector with some non-zero points, so it, it exists. Okay. Do, it, does it get harder as D increases? Like, is there some notion of like the size of the set that you need to form a design increases as D gets larger? Oh yeah, the number of points will increase. So, for example, you can look at the Clifford group, uh, you know, and as you as you scale up the number of qubits, the Clifford group gets bigger and bigger. So the space get if the sp as bigger the bigger the space gets, the more points you're gonna mm -hmm. need. Yeah, um, but that's a separate issue that the than than the issue of whether it's even possible or not. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always possible, and you'll need to get more points. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Brian, for being one of the audience members to ask a question. So we're going to remove uh, normalization uh, constraints. And uh, in continuous variables, this is not something completely crazy. So this is actually something that people study all the time and experiment as well, um, cons namely considering norm by, uh, states of fixed position and momentum. So those are precise you know, denoted by precise values of position momentum, infinitely precise, in fact. They don't really exist in the real world, but they're a good approximation for what you're actually trying to measure, namely the position or the momentum. Those types of states are non-normalizable. And those types of states are now what we're going to be trying to use to form designs. And it turns out that such rigged designs, uh, the word rigged here is used because such states are formally elements of a rigged, or can be understood from a rigged Hilbert space construction, and these designs, if you use non-normalizable non states, they do exist. And the designs that we found are actually not consistent position and momentum states. Um, you may be not surprised because those would be Gaussian states or limits, limiting sort of Gaussian states. And uh, uh, I showed you before those don't exist or don't form designs or sorry, Gaussian operations don't form unitary designs. So you would maybe expect Gaussian states don't form state designs. We did not find any rig designs made of Gaussian states. We did find something that was sort of around the corner from Gaussian state. So namely, we have this radial kind of understanding of the harmonic oscillator using its number and phase degrees of freedom, kind of like a polar decomposition of coordinates. And um, the number uh, degree of freedom is uh, basically characterized by these Fox states. Or, um, and uh, the phase is, is, is uh, labeled by these phase states. So these are rays in the, in the, in the phase space of the oscillator. Uh, at particular angles of the oscillator, denoted by theta here. And if we take this number phase decomposition of the oscillator and we further evolve the phase states, um, or evolve both of them actually, by this Kerr Ham Hamiltonian, which is just a, a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian squared, generating that evolution, uh, we get, that should be phi n squared, sorry, uh, we get uh, these set of curd phase states and Fox states, and together that set makes a, a state design. That's a two, a rig two design. So that means you can integrate, you know, degree two polynomials over this infinite dimensional space and uh, get the same get the same kind of result that you would expect if you were considering integration over all states. And this is something that had not been done in infinite dimension. So. Um, the phase states basically being equal linear superpositions, as you can see, uh, if you don't curve them or you don't ignore the phases, the, the states, the phase state zero sub zero is a uniform superposition. That gives you this normalized, non-normalizable centroid. We simply took the centroid and we removed the normalization. 
Uh, Victor, I, I have another question. I think a dumb question, but um, so so here this this set is still infinite, right? You have a sum of of n bigger than or equal to zero. Yeah, you need an infinite. You need a non-normalizable state to form a rig design. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, I see. But uh, but the set on the right hand side is is parameterized by theta and phi. And the okay, okay. So so the summation is is a non-normalizable part. Um, and uh, so so can you take uh, like a grid of theta and phi between minus phi and phi as as a set to uh, is 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 this what forms the discrete set the design? Well, in this case, the set is not discrete. Hmm. The set has to be continuous. Um, uh, because the infinite dimensional state space is sort of massively continuous. And uh, um, in, in this case, the integral does not reduce to a sum. It reduces to an easier integral. Oh, OK. I see. I see. Yeah. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, one application. So here, here come the application. So one, the, the first application is uh, um, to a relation between fidelities that people utilize in, 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 in state tomography and experiment and theory. Uh, for qubits. So qubit state designs allow for this relation between two fidelities of some particular channel that you're interested in understanding. And usually one fidelity is easy for you to obtain and you can't, and the other one is hard, but there's this formula that relates the two. So if you know one, you know the other for free. And the two fidelities are this average fidelity F bar and entanglement fidelity F E. And they're useful for characterizing the channel. And I, I can Tell you what they are, but I could just I just write them down, and you can ask if you want. So, um, the point is that we can this this to prove this relation equivalence between these two fidelities. You need designs. You need state designs, and you can see kind of why because you see you have two copies of a state psi uh, in the f bar case, and you're integrating. So, uh, remember, two copies of a state psi means there's some sort of polynomial function of degree two being integrated over. So we can use our uh, state designs for the infinity, for infinite dimensional case to develop uh, an analogous notion of fidelity for, uh, uh, for, or to develop an analogous relation between fidelities analogous to these qubit fidelities. And uh, we're gonna be using uh, normalizable. So now we can induce normalization on these states. They don't quite form you know, exact designs if this beta variable, this normalization parameter is uh, non-zero. Uh, but we can define these regularized versions of our designs and show that they approach designs, true state rig designs in a controllable way. And uh, the reason we do this is because this, this relates now our, our new sort of regularized rig designs to notions of fidelity that have been around in conventional continuous variable information processing. Namely, uh, there is a continuous variable analog of entanglement fidelity where the state phi used in defining the fidelity is this two what's called the two mode squeeze state and that two mode squeeze state has a similar type of beta normalization parameter and so if we plug that in on the side of f bar which is the average over the design then we can relate this average fidelity f bar to the entanglement fidelity fe and obtain a similar looking formula the difference kind of being is that we don't have a sharply cut off state space of D dimensions. Now we have an infinite dimensional state space and we can occupy certain states up to some amount of energy in it uh, as, as denoted by this beta parameter. And so now this gives us an infinite dimensional version of these uh, fidelity relations with an effective dimension D beta, uh, basically characterizing or denoting uh, how large the set of states um, of particular expectation value of the photon number is. And now we'll finally get to tomography. So there's, again, we're going to take a qubit protocol and try to generalize it to continuous variable using our nice uh, shiny new designs. Uh, the qubit protocol that, that uh, we're going to be utilizing is this uh, shadow state tomography. And uh, this is a very simple protocol that uh, basically takes a quantum state uh, and tries to approximate it with a set of shadows. Uh, and uh, each shadow is, is basically just taking the state, measuring in one of three different bases, either 0, 1, plus, minus, or plus, minus, i basis. So you flip a three-sided coin, 
you figure out which basis you want to measure, and then you do a quantum measurement. So it's a combination of classical and quantum randomness, and it, and you get a you get a measurement outcome. So you get the type of measurement, and you get a measurement outcome, and then you store those, and you can construct little operators out of them, like as I show here. And it turns out that just averaging those operators gets you the state as the number of samples goes to infinity, which is kind of an amazing thing when you first see it. And the property to show that these, the number of, not only that this is true on average, but also that the number of shadows you need scales very favorably with the number of, with the qubit dimension, uh, resulting in not too many to get a good approximate of the state. The, 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 the proof requires you to use state designs. So these are basically actually state, th these, these six states I'm listing here are elements of a state design. And now that we're armed with continuous variable state designs, we can try to do the same thing. And it works the same way. So it turns out that if you have, if you now decide to flip a coin whether and decide whether you're going to measure in the FOC or the phase state basis, then if you if you measure in the phase state basis, you, you flip a continuous coin to determine which curve angle you'll need, which curve angle phi. Once you do that, you have a complete set of states to use to, for measurement, and you can measure in this phase state POVM. And then you obtain some outcome, and uh, those give you the state with high prob with with high probability for a sufficiently large number of samples. And again, it's because of this property that the state the states form a rig two design. So these are not just useful for measuring; they're also useful for this um, uh, for 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 actual tomographic procedures. Um, as a side point, we can also uh, take this shadow type framework and reinterpret existing tomographic protocols that people know and love from quantum optics in terms of the statistical sort of mindset of shadows. And uh, so if you take some protocol from quantum optics, what it usually does is it expands the state in some basis of, of, of operators of arbitrary complexity. The operators are sigma and the coefficients here are P and then you have some space that you're summing over x. And um, the if you now take your physicist hat off and put on your statistician hat, you can express or interpret this uh, sum, a linear combination of operators as an expectation value of sample over samples. Now, this is true only when the p's, the coefficients, actually satisfy sort of probabilistic type relations, namely where you can make probabilities out of them. If you can do that, then it turns out that you can interpret this as a statistical expectation value and um, then construct shadows for that. And so now with, with, with shadows, you basically just take averages over uh, samples and use that in lieu or instead of this full-blown expectation value over the whole space. And uh, on average, this with as t grows to infinite, this winds up packing the whole space and you get the exact equality for the state. But now the question is how efficient is this? So for, you know, how does T scale with the, with the size of the space of the state that you're trying to, to approximate? And uh, to determine that you basically use laws of large numbers for matrices. And um, you, can, you can determine how T scales with, with the parameters of interest. So this offers another way to view uh, conventional, say, homodyne um, uh, technology. So in homodyne, you have this complicated looking expression, but you can rephrase it in this sort of more general language. The p's are just expectation values of rho in a position state, or some quadrature state. And then there's some crazy looking pattern functions, f, that, you, that, that are just like, you can just take you know, for granted. And if you sample these pattern functions, uh, it turns out with high probability, the number of samples t scales with uh, the photon number cutoff n of your harmonic oscillator space as n to the fifth log n. So it's polynomial. And it also scales, uh, you know, depending, you can gauge how accurate this is depending on how many samples you do, uh, because the number of sample scales is one over epsilon squared with the accuracy of the estimate. So that ends the tomography discussion. We also have other tomographic protocols we we recast into this shadow sort of framework in this other paper that I'll mention at the end of my talk. But now I'll move on to error correction. And uh, uh, I'll have sort of a loose, hopefully lucid tutorial on error correction. 
the goal of error correction is to preserve messages sent through a noisy transmission channel by encoding the messages in an error correcting code. Now, this is something that's a very general framework that was started by Shannon over 70 years ago. It's beautiful in that it encompasses uh, both classical and quantum transmission of information and transmission of both classical and quantum information. So the same framework that was started long ago is basically utilized by us now for, for our quantum devices. And the framework is as follows. You have a message row uh, that you want to transmit over some time or space distance to uh, a receiver. And you don't want to just transmit the message by itself because it will corrupt the message partially and you, the receiver won't get the message. So what you do <clears throat> is you encode the message in a larger space to utilize the redundancy of the larger, of the larger space. You do that using an encoding map or encoder that embeds the message in this larger space in some clever way, such that when you send it through a noise channel, you can the, the receiver on the other end will can obtain the information, can extract the information back out of the you know, noise channel, the other end of the noise channel, such that for the most part, the message is recovered. Now I say for the most part, because it's never going to be recovered perfectly, but for all intents and purposes, you know, right now you're it's being recovered over the, the internet and you're hearing my voice without much corruption. So error correction works. So this has been used a lot. Various different error correction protocols have been used a lot over this in distributed storage, uh, in wireless systems, in broadcasting, in cellular communication. Um, and of course, we use uh, this type of paradigm to transmit and store quantum information in our quantum memories and our quantum networks. <clears throat> so um, here's a bird's eye view of error correction. Uh, so we have this protocol to try to redundantly encode. And there's various different ways to encode. And uh, the space that you're encoding your classical bits or, or more generally classical structures is called an alphabet. And classical code words are basically elements of an alphabet. So traditionally people think of bits, but you can think of other sort of bigger strings. You can even think of encoding in reals, so an sending analog signals. And uh, you can encode in any finite group if you want. It. And the point of this slide is that quantum um, code words and wave functions, again, something that maybe goes back to the basics a bit, uh, these are just functions over the alphabet. So while co co classical code words are single elements, quantum code words or quantum states uh, of an error correcting code are defined to be functions over the, so they evaluate to some coefficient next to the particular canonical basis state labeled by the bit. And so there's quantum analogs of all of these things. And uh, the obvious one for bits is qubits. Uh, but maybe the one for reals that we're going to be considering is, is the harmonic oscillator, these continuous variable state space. But there's also these other cuted state times, cuted type spaces that you might be interested to check out in the error correcting zoo. So how do we encode? So how do we encode information? Well, classically, it's typically not very difficult conceptually to grasp how to encode information. Uh, if you want to consider encoding bits, then you just pick particular bit values in your redundant space of bit strings such that they're separated enough so that if you flip a couple, you know, they're not going to stray too far away to the to the region of this other bit. So if you flip, if you in this cube geometry, Hamming cube geometry, you see if you flip one bit, the all zero bit stays in its what's called Voronoi cell, meaning this it's closer, the set of points closer to the all zero bit than to the all one bit. And if you do that, then you can recover reliably because you can just recover by saying, okay, anything that's in this region that's closest to this all zeros is just going to be denoted as the all zero state. It's going to be mapped to the all zero state and anything that's in the all, next to the all one state is going to map to the all one state. This is just how basic classical correction works. And you can, you can pack you know, larger state spaces in some other way. And so here's a more complicated example of the single parity check code, which encodes you know, eight, uh, uh, three bits worth of information, so eight states worth of information in this uh, hypercube. You can likewise, as I said, encode in a lattice, so you can just encode points in a well-separated way in, 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 sorry, in the real numbers, which winds up being a lattice if you enforce some periodicity. So a lattice you can think of as an error-correcting code in the, over the reals. And likewise, you can think of encoding in spheres, which correspond to actually energy-constrained analog signals over multiple modes. 
in the original Shannon paradigm. So uh, if you if you encode over a sphere, then the question becomes of how to sort of dis, di, you know pack points in a sphere such that they're far enough apart from each other, such that small distortions won't map them into the you know Voronoi cell of the other point. So that's how classical error correction works. What do you do with quantum? Well, you just superpose some of the classical code words into quantum code words in order to protect from phase noise. So quantum information you're required to not just protect from bit flip noise, but also from relative phases that are induced by your environment. And to protect from phase noise, you have to, uh, you have to uh, pick superpositions of, of classical code words uh, in order for the code to protect from phase noise. So each of these have sort of quantum analogs. The quantum repetition code, uh, it stores a qubit. There's no extra points to superpose. Each code word has one uh, basis state in it, and it doesn't protect from phase noise. However, if you take the single parity check, you can turn it into the 422 code, uh, which now you see each of the four qubits, uh, each of the, sorry, each of the four logical states or logical code words does have two basis states in it, which allows you to protect from phase noise. This is why, the, by the way, why you need entanglement in error correction to protect, uh, to protect from phase noise. Likewise, if you consider uh, superpositions of different points, subsets of points on a lattice, you get these things called GKP codes or quantum lattice codes more generally. And what we did uh, in this recent work is generalize this to spheres and, and figured out ways to try to take superposition of points on a sphere to get these quantum spherical codes. Okay, so the, the, the work that we've been uh, doing, which helps with... Uh, well, well I'll, I'll give you the application a bit later, but we developed this general class of quantum spherical codes, which are analogs of classical spherical codes. And uh, it's general in the sense that you can, you can apply this method of constructing codes to any configuration space that takes values in a sphere in the quantum world. And that, of course, includes most prominently the coherent states, but it also includes all sorts of other coherent-like states uh, and also spin coherent states, uh, which are amena, sort of applicable to nuclei, uh, uh, to large nuclear systems, and also even just molecular position states, namely the, the orientations of a, of, of a molecule, a diatomic, you know, are labeled by a point on a sphere, right? So any sort of spherical configuration space is amenable to these codes. And uh, as usual with quantum error correction, there's two types of phase noise. There's noise that rotates points along in the sphere, and that's quantified basically by this Euclidean distance, minimal Euclidean distance between points making up each code word. And also there's a uh, phase noise induced on the sphere, which corresponds to the environment trying to you know, measure a potential function over the sphere, a potential function that takes different values at the different points of the code. And that's how the environment can try to sniff out by taking expectation values of the code in the code words of some potential function. And uh, you can then characterize these potential functions using some spherical harmonics, or some polynomials. And for bosonic modes, it'll be easiest to characterize them in loss and gain, uh, in, in terms of uh, loss and gain operators. So that's what I'm going to briefly discuss uh, for the rest of the talk. So the, the main sort of uh, playground for these spherical codes that has, I think, the most ap applicable uh, apply applicability is uh, the the cat code so is the the, the coherent state uh, codes so what we've generalized here if we apply the, this framework is the following so what's been known before is 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 a cat codes for a single mode which are just uh, uh, you know each code word is defined by some set of points and they're superposed so the red points are superposed the blue, blue points are superposed and that gives you a logical code word of a cat code and the points just make up uh, the vertices of a polygon a square or hexagon, et cetera. And what we've done is finally been able to sort of map this or generalize this to uh, multiple modes where now you, you have to look at, you can look at higher dimensional polytopes and superpose their vertices to get more codes that perform uh, uh, you know, better. And uh, there's lots of different fun polytopes to choose from and uh, including ones in higher dimension because an n-mode phase space is 2n dimensional. And so you have to look at 2n dimensional polytopes. So uh, I'll just review here briefly the math uh, that 
in terms of what, what coherent states are. So coherent states are, are basically just little Gaussian blobs in the harmonic oscillator position phase space. And the, they're characterized by their center, which is a complex number alpha. Um, the overlap between the coherent states depends on the Euclidean distance between the two points characterizing the centers of the coherent states, alpha and beta. It's an exponential of the Euclidean distance. Um, and as much as you'd like it for, cube, for, for the qubit paradigm of Pauli matrices to transfer over to this world, it doesn't. However, there is something that comes close, namely the lowering operator uh, admits the coherent states as right eigenstates. So when you apply a lowering operator to the coherent state, you get out uh, the number alpha that labels the coherent state. And um, I don't know why it didn't render, but it should be alpha sub j uh, on the right-hand side there. Uh, your X-type operators, Pauli X matrices, uh, do kind of survive in the form of these rotations that allow you to rotate a coherent state um, <clears throat> to some other value in a way that preserves this norm. And more generally, for the N-mode case, it corresponds to a passive optical, passive linear optical transformation. It's like a beam splitter or a phase shifter applied to the vector alpha, which rotates it to another point on the sphere uh, defined by the norm of alpha. So what we're going to do is we're going to impose this unit sphere constraint and look at how we can define points on the um, on a sphere that to make codes. So for the simple example that has already been known, each as I said, each code word is a is a superposition of of a constellation of points, a logical constellation or a code word constellation. In this case, there's only two points, and um, rotation protection is quantified by the minimum distance between the points, which I'll take to be the square root of the Euclidean distance. So that's how much protection against sort of dephasing and rotation noise is, 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 is by the code. And uh, because there's two points, this code can actually detect and correct one photon loss or gain. And uh, so that's the protection of this code. But now you can imagine, of course, taking more superpositions, more states in a superposition to make a polygon. And uh, the more states you take, the smaller the resolution becomes. So the less rotations you can protect against but the more losses you can protect against. So there's a trade-off. You want to protect against more losses. You pick more points in the constellation, but then the price you pay is a lower resolution and therefore a lower degree of protection against rotation. Just like phase and bit flip noise for, pal for, for codes over qubits, there's going to be a trade-off. And there's, uh, as I said, there's these Z-type operators uh, and their powers will actually give you stabilizers and logical operators for the code. So A squared, you, you, if you look at how a squared acts on the code, it'll actually um, uh, it'll actually transform one state into the other. Um, or sorry, it, it it won't transform. It'll be a, a z type operator, so it'll it'll spit out plus one basically and minus one depending on which code word it acts on. And then if you square that, you get a to the fourth, and that thing leaves both code words invariant, evaluating to a, alpha to the fourth because the points are roots of unity, fourth roots of unity. So those are your Z-type operators. Your X-type operators for the code are actual rigid rotations, right? You can imagine rotating by 90 degrees and then the blue dumbbell goes to where the red one is and vice versa. So that's your logical operation. That's your logical kind of Pauli operation. And then a stabilizer is or not 180 degree rotation, right? Because both dumbbells are invariant. So now let's go to the, something that, that we were developing. And now we look at a two-mode constellation. So now each point in the constellation is, is actually a vector of two complex numbers defining coherent states over two modes. And we can superpose points in a five cell, which is an analog, two a four-dimensional analog of a simplex. Um, the set of points, uh, so the vertices of a simplex uh, are defined to be such that all their distances are equal. A tetrahedron is a simplex. All of its distances, all the edges are the same length. And in four dimensions, you can have an analog kind of creature here, the simplex. If we take a simplex, we make a logical zero code word. We invert it through the origin. We get a logical one code word for with its own simplex. So now what do we gain by expanding to two modes? Well, not much for this code, actually. We, gain a re we don't gain much in the resolution. The resolution here is actually lower than the than than a cat with four components, meaning where the the logical constellation forms a square for each code word. 
Uh, however, it does detect one more loss than the four cat code and corrects as much as many losses as the four cat code. Um, its Z type stabilizers are now two mode monomials. And there's actually two two mode monomials that you need for this simplex, A squared B4, A cubed B. So the overhead here is, is higher at not much of a gain in error correction. Uh, but I just wanted to make to let you know that all of these types of stabilizers and logical operators do transfer to multiple modes to these other codes. Um, and uh, what's kind of cute about this is that there's an infinite family of simplices in, in any dimension. There's, an, there's one in each dimension. And so we have this infinite family of codes that we can cook up. And uh, they detect the same amount of losses independent of the number of modes. However, the resolution keeps increasing because you're using higher dimensions and it approaches the resolution of the forecat while detecting one more loss. So that code is just a tutorial. It's not that exciting. Uh, if you get to three modes, you have this beautiful Hessian code. So now you have vectors of length three of complex numbers, and you have 27 of them defining a logical zero code word and another 27 defining logical one. And uh, this one now is, 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 kind of, is performing quite well. Its resolution is the same as that of a six component cat code. Remember, the more components, the more losses you can protect against. So the six component cat code protects against uh, um, not well, uh, I think three losses. I forget the factors of two. But the point is that this Hessian code is the same as the six component cat code, but it detects a lot more losses than the six component cat code. It detects as many losses as the 18 component cat code and corrects as many losses as the eight component cat code. So the six component cat code then I think corrects two losses. This corrects one more loss and detects six more losses. Its Z-type stabilizers are these nice combinations of, uh, of A, B, and C, lowering operators of the three modes. You have to have three of them. Um, the Z-type logicals also exist. They're again some monomials. Now you can start including the raising operator. When you project it into the code, you get alpha squared, and, or alpha star, sorry. And uh, you also get a Z-type logical operator that spits out the sign of the depending on which code word it acts on. Um, what's interesting about this code is that if you look at the, is when uh, you can see, if you look at the degree of the polynomials forming the Z-type stabilizers. Now this code can detect eight losses which means it can detect an operator such as a to the eighth. But notice that it's that the, the degree of the, of the um, stabilizers is less than eight. And this is something, well, and, and moreover, the degree of the stabilizers is less than that of the logicals. So the, some of the stabilizers here are degree three, while the logicals are degree nine or degree five. And this is reminiscent, should be reminiscent of the surface code. The surface code has logicals that are these, you know, strings, large strings, while the stabilizers are just weight four. So the weight, the pally weight of the stabilizers is much less, or the stabilizer generators is much less than that of the logicals. And uh, this has not been seen before in the cat code world. And this is the first code that we saw that, that does this. So it's sort of like a quantum feature. Um, <clears throat> if you flip the parity of all three modes, that's a logical. Uh, very easy X logical. And then if you want to do, uh, if what what is this code stabilized by? Well, it turns out that it's stabilized by a non-abelian group of Gaussian type cyclic, uh, uh, cyclic permutation operations and phase shifts by cube roots of unity of each mode. Uh, this group is the group of, this is the stabilizer group of this constellation of states. Um, I wanted to briefly uh, sort of mention the general perspective on uh, quantum error correction also involves uh, logical Z measurements. And one simple way to try to view logical Z measurements is just to try to project onto each Voronoi cell of uh, the different code words. So if you want a Z measurement, you, you do, you do a, P, a fancy POVM, which consists of either projecting on all the blue region of the soccer ball or all the white region of the soccer ball, right? And the same you can do with lattices and, 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 and all these other structures. And uh, one of the things that we figured out how to do is how to do this for continuous variables. So if you remember those phase states I mentioned from the uh, beginning of the talk, those were rays in phase space. And those can be used to measure the angle of the oscillator, of a state of the oscillator. 
because they resolve the identity, they resolve the, 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 the identity on the, on the single mode. But this is only true for one mode. But how do you measure points on a sphere? Let's say you have a you know, two n dimensional sphere and you wanna be able to uh, do a measurement of only some regions of the sphere. You can't use the phase states because those are only defined on a single mode. And if you just stack them up, you get a, a torus-like measurement because each one is an angle for each mode. You need something that is truly spherical. And so we worked out, it turns out that there exists a, pure, a projection valued measure uh, or, a posit or an operator valued measure of uh, these spherical states, which generalize the phase states, uh, namely that they're, these spherical states take values in the, in the sphere defined on n by n modes. They resolve the identity. They transform the same way as coherent states do. And their normalization is, is similar to that of the phase states, but now you can do this for multiple modes. So this allows you to do in part, uh, besides measuring a point on a sphere in, in an efficient way, this also allows you to measure regions on the sphere and thereby do a logical Z measurement, for example, for the quantum spherical codes. Now, I mentioned that the, the stabilizer groups of X-type operators for these spherical codes are not abelian, namely they don't commute. Uh, this gives us some very interesting features. So the sort of the, the, the piece of the formalism that I'll describe is, is as follows. Uh, for the polytope cat codes, uh, each polytope that makes the code word, whose vertices make up the code word, has some symmetry group. So if you have a triangle, right, like a, for a cat code, its symmetry group is the uh, group of rotations uh, by, uh, one, you know, by um, 120 degrees. We'll, we're not doing reflections here because those are not unitary. So um, this group of rotations is Z3. And uh, if you stack two triangles together to make the full polytope of the code, because each code word now participates in that polytope, you get Z6. And um, these are the groups that we are picking out of to figure out what our stabilizer is. So the stabilizer group in general uh, is something that acts on the full code polytope but it acts in such a way that it leaves each code word polytope in its same location. So it doesn't permute the code word polytopes when it acts on the code polytope. And while in the cat code case, everything is abelian, so everything is basically there's, you know, the whole Z, um, half of the Z6 group is a stabilizer. Um, in general, each code word polytope comes with its own uh, manifestation of, of the symmetry group, and they're related to each other by conjugation. And so what you, the stabilizer group for a non-abelian quantum spherical code is actually the intersection of all of those logical polytope symmetry groups. And that intersection can be small or it can be large. So here's two, and so the, if we, then once we find the stabilizer group, then the rest are just logical. So we can determine the logical group easily after that. So what's interesting here is that the stabilizer group can be very large or very small. And it gives us kind of a gate stabilizer trade-off. The more stabilizers we have in our polytope group, the fewer gates and vice versa. So if in, in this example, we have a large stabilizer, which means we have a lo small logical. It's our Hessian. What's the symmetry group of the Hessian of the polytope formed by both uh, code words? Well, it's this thing. It's got 1296 elements. It's some Coxeter group. Um, now, which elements of it leave the individual code words invariant? Well, half of the group, 648 elements are stabilizers. This includes those beam splitters and phase shifters I mentioned before. So what's left? Well, you divide one by the other, you just get one logical. It's the X type logical pally that I mentioned before. So lots of stabilizers, very small logical group. What about um, another example? Well, here we'll have a small stabilizer and a large logical. So we have, now we're gonna encode a five dimensional logical qubit. And for each element of the qubit, we're gonna make, uh, we're gonna encode it in a 24 cell. Okay, and we're gonna have five 24 cells and they're gonna make this thing called a 600 cell. It's kind of like an icosahedron, but in four dimensions. What's the symmetry group of an icosahedron in four dimensions? Or this hyper icosahedron? The binary icosahedral group, 2i. It's got 120 elements. 
How many of those leave the thing in var the, the each each five 24 cell invariant? Actually, only two. Nothing, the identity, and uh some I think it's maybe a parody again. I don't remember. Divide, you get a real a representation of the full icosahedral group with all of its 60 elements acting as a permutation representation on the five-dimensional qubit um, formed by the five polytopes. So you get a very large uh, gate group here. Now, what's interesting about this is that these types of gates as rigid rotation, they're, they're, they're basically fault tolerant because they preserve all of the code properties. Uh, they preserve the resolution of the code and the, the points in the constellation because they rigidly rotate. So they're basically analogs of fault tolerant gates for quantum spherical codes. And what's cool about this is that the icosahedral group is can be realized only using two modes here. This is a four-dimensional space, so it's two modes. So uh, it's uh, so this while this doesn't give you a lot of stabilizers, so it's going to be tricky to do error correction using stabilizer formalism. This does give you a lot of logical gates in a way that many qubit codes struggle to give you with, with sort of similar similar amount of subsystems. You can't get this with two qubits. You can't get any correction with two qubits at all. Okay, um, I'm probably not going to be able to cover communication. We we have a few minutes left. I think at some point I'll lose the room, but um, if you want to try to quickly go through it. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. So uh, now I'll quickly cover some of the communication aspects of this continuous variable stuff that we've been doing. And it, again, stems from error correction. So you have, uh, now we're going to focus back on codes on a lattice. Instead of looking at how to pack a sphere or a circle, we're going to look at the left panel here and we're consider using lattices. Now, and immediately I'm going to say something very abstract uh, because, well, yeah, because I, 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 I don't have too much time for this, but basically while I've looked at spherical codes, which deal with rotations, lattice codes deal with translations. And those translations are basically analogs of the conventional Pauli matrices. They're more, much more faithful analogs of the conventional Pauli matrices for qubits. And so this class of lattice codes or GKP codes is very much as a relative of the qubit class of, of codes called CSS codes or CSS stabilizer codes. And um, all of the, both of those things can be generalized to more general types of qubits, group valued qubits in this non-abelian, what we call group GKP framework. Uh, and uh, I'll just summarize it with this table, which includes here both the qubit CSS and the GKP, various variants of GKP codes. Uh, and basically, you can just define them by, by taking your uh, uh, group, by, by, by taking map, thinking of your configuration space as a group. So the set of all bit strings, you can think of as a group. The set of all reals, you can think of as a group. Particle on a sphere, its, its positions are also a group. And you pick a particular subgroup of that, and you get a code. Okay, so basically, each of these types of codes can be in the abstract defined using some subgroup of the group defining your configuration space. So this is a quite a general framework. It doesn't give you all the nuances associated with specific codes, but it gives you sort of an umbrella framework to deal with. And the point is that the states uh, that, that give you code words in this particular code and error words using this particular framework, namely stabilizers, CSS stabilizer states, GKP states, GKP rotor states, they actually are useful primitives for communication. And this general framework that we formulated allowed us to prove this for all of these different group valued constructions. So <clears throat> it turns out that if you try to, if you define an error state for this code, which is just not a uniform superposition no longer, it's it has some phases and it's shifted. So the phase is denoted by S prime, the shift is denoted by S, and it's this is just associated with an error acting on a code word, which is a linear superposition, a uniform superposition. So if you take these error states and you try to uh, try to measure the shift and the both both uh, both elements of the error at the same time. You can't do it because entanglement is monogamous. And monogamy of entanglement can be used to prove that cryptographic protocols using such states, just like BB84, which uses these CSS-like states, are secure. And uh, we did this for these more general group-valued GKP construction states, formulating uh, cryptographic protocols um, that are robust. 
uh, for all these various uh, uh, platforms, including harmonic oscillators. Um, now, nowhere except in crypto are you, you know, as rigorous as I've, I've never seen anybody be more rigorous than people in crypto. So this involved a lot of sort of making all of the stuff I said very, very precise. Uh, so kudos, props to, to Eric and Tama uh, for helping with this and for Eric for basically spearheading these 63 pages of work. So with that, I'll conclude. Um, Maryland is a very exciting place. Um, uh, we have a, a multitude of quantum centers and basically experts in every field. Um, I want to just to reca rehash, so we've uh, studied quite a lot of things today. It's kind of one of these busy talks. I introduced continuous variable designs, rig designs. Uh, this was work by Joe uh, and collaborators here. Uh, I recast known shadow to uh, known uh, tomographic protocols in terms of this lens, statistical lens of shadows, of classical shadows. And uh, Srilika and collaborators are uh, on this paper. Um, uh, the, I then went into sort of uh, uh, some packing of things on spheres. This is these are my collaborators for that, and uh, I did not have time to cover that paper. But uh, uh, the the coset monogamy games using these generalized error correcting uh, code and error states uh, were done by Eric and uh, Tama. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Victor, uh, for this really, really great talk. Um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording now, but do you have a, a few minutes to hang around for your questions? Sure. Okay.